Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I will give a few seconds for all participants to enter into this uh, webinar. It's a gradual process with Zoom. They enter one by one, even if they're all waiting in the waiting room. Good. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in our webinar on an extremely important and topical subject. I'm your host, Twan van Gerwe. I'm technical director within global animal nutrition company, EW Nutrition. Today, we have with us Dr. Miel Hostens from the Department of Population Health Sciences within the veterinary, of, veterinary faculty of Utrecht University in the Netherlands. In his job as assistant professor, Miel focuses on herd health management in relation to precision livestock management and big data in dairy cows. So he's driven by a passion for dairy farming as he grew up on his grandmother's farm. His interest moved towards data science, uh, influenced by a technology-driven mother, and eventually he found the sweet spot between both disciplines. So it is his passion for these disciplines that makes him the perfect speaker for today's webinar, as he shares his ideas on how to use data to manage the transition period of dairy cows optimally. Bill, thanks for joining. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Twan. Uh, so now a, a, a few technical points to explain the setup of this webinar. Mil um, will deliver his presentation of about 40 minutes. And during this presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A form that opens when you, uh, when, you, uh, when you click on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So these questions are read and possibly answered in real time by myself if they are not too technical. Uh, and if, they are, and if they require a longer or more complex answer, then obviously um, Mil will, with his expertise, he will address them in the, in the dedicated Q&A sessions that starts directly after his presentation. Once again, thank you all for being here. And now uh, let's start. Okay, so I will share my screen. First, one you have to just indicate whether that um, yes. is okay. I will sh tell you when it shows up. You should be able to see now, and I hope you see it full screen. Is Correct. that okay? Yet? Yes. Yep. Perfect. All right. Perfect. I think it's uh, for the listeners. Also in the room, I think it's best if you move me up in the left upper corner, if you want to see both a uh, face and, um, and the slides, I have arranged it so that the slides will appear a bit, little bit on the right. And then the, uh, the remainder of the, let's say of my head will can show up in the left upper corner. That's nice to follow. So first of all, thanks for the invitation uh, of EW Nutrition uh, to talk about uh, something which is uh, quite close to my, uh, let's say, uh, core passion. It's about reproduction and uh, the transition cow. But then uh, um, applied to the um, to the to the to, let's say the data driven side of all of this. So first of all, for those people who have no idea who I am, um, I grew up on a dairy farm. So this is me somewhere in the uh, late eighties who was playing around on the dairy farm of my grandmother. Um, that's where I got the passion for the dairy industry. That's where I learned how to milk cows very simply. Uh, but today you can uh, see me as somebody who's working at two places, which is University of Ghent, where I graduated as a veterinary student. I did a PhD on top of that and a master in data science. Yeah, and eventually I um, um, now I'm working as an assistant professor at U Utrecht University. And some people might also know me from the, the Moogle project, which is one of my, let's say, babies uh, with, which, uh, with whom I'm working to try to work with data on farms all over the world. So I've, I have a big passion uh, for cows. You can see that here. I, I will travel with students to, um, to um, large dairy farms. I will travel myself to large dairy farms to help them out uh, troubleshooting. 
Uh, and then once in a while, I try to be a father uh, for the children at home. So that's a bit of an introduction um, uh, from myself. Uh, meanwhile, <clears throat> let's first start with some basic things. Um, one of the things that I would like to, to really share with you as well is the, when we talk about transition cows, I think it's important that we all understand why we drink milk yeah, as mammals. So to give you an idea, this is a picture from uh, our daughter when she was born the last one of the two children uh, to give you an idea it took us about yeah, 200 million 250 million years to just develop towards um, a trait which is eventually um, uh, called lactogenesis so that we produce uh, milk for our offspring it took that took us about 250 years that's not something which uh, developed easily yeah that has developed really bit by bit by bit and it took us eventually yeah, about 230 billion years yeah, to get there yeah. um, it's called um, mammals because of the word uh, mammae yeah so the the latin word for other or breasts or whatever you want to call it yeah so and i think it's important that you understand um the the, the power of that thing right now we have a lot of debate going on in the industry on 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 the on the value let's say of milk yeah and, but i would like to show you some data i'm a data freak so that's something that you need to um, um acknowledge um and you will see immediately why so th let me show you the data of our uh, latest born daughter and i want you to focus on the last two two um uh, points so this is the weight i asked the nurses to weigh uh, noura every day and then you see the average weight from day seven until day 21 yeah where she grew yeah, if I show you the metric, she grew from 3.6 to 4.2 kilogram yeah, uh, in body weight. That means that she grew about 43 kilogram, uh, grams per day, 43 grams, whereas at that time, she only drank milk. I can assure you uh, she only drank milk. Human milk yeah, contains about 10% dry matter. She drank at that moment uh, 0.6 milliliters per day. Yeah, even maybe a little bit less. Yeah, but then if you do the, the, the maths, 10%, yeah, 600 milliliters, that means that she's drinking about, let's say, um, 60 grams, yeah, whereas she grows 42 grams. Yeah. So what's her feed conversion? Very simply, you, if you would compare her uh, to beef, which is six to one, yeah, pigs, 3.5 to one, chicken, two uh, kilograms of feed intake for one uh, kilogram of meat, two to one, and then catfish, it's a special animal, one to one, then you would you could put her somewhere over there. Yeah, she's at a 1.5 uh, feed conversion at that moment. So very efficient. And if you do that long enough, she grows and keeps on growing yeah, towards the point where she is now uh, three years old. Of course, um, you people will all, all almost immediately debate, yeah, but that's uh, when you are young. And indeed, that's correct. When we are young, yeah, then... Um, we are uh, able to drink milk, but we keep on having that possibility. I have a, a, a typo on the screen, but why do we adults, um, or let's say, why do adult Western European people drink milk? And then it's important to understand that somewhere 8,000 years ago, that we have early signals that people were at that moment probably in contact with a lot of milk. 8,000 years ago, yeah, which uh, was, um, was, which was uh, proven by the fact that they found clay pots with very small holes inside of it. And those clay pots yeah, with small holes were probably signals of human people yeah, um, trying to get um, to, to, um, to work with milk in a different way yeah, than they would just drink it. Because probably when they would drink it at that moment, they would get diarrhea. Because one of the things which is very, very important to understand is that at that, that time, people were lactose intolerant. So normally, all mammals are lactose intolerant. But around 8,000 years ago, there was, must have been one man yeah, who had a gene mutation or defect, whatever you want to call it. He had a gene mutation. And because of that, yeah, that gene was spread out to the Western Europe and then North American population, yeah, Australian, New Zealand. Yeah, and... This has been put by very many researchers as an important part of what they call the developing world or the developed world. So Western Europe has flourished partly on the availability of agriculture in which yeah, also the ability to, to digest lactose has been a very important. 
Um, we have about five gene, def gene mutations in the world to uh, um, cause lac lactose tolerance. Yeah, and then you, for example, you see the one in the middle, yeah, where I now um, mouse over with my mouse. Yeah, that one is the one in Western Europe. And then you see that there are three others in Africa and one in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and these genes are then spread out over the world. But it's an important part to think about because if you look from a global challenge, we need to understand yeah, that there is an extreme amount of people coming to the world. Yeah, there's about three extra billion people right now that are coming to our world yeah, and that will drink milk. If you look especially, it's at this moment, yeah, we are somewhere over here. It's especially the African world yeah, and the Asian world that um, are, are, let's say, booming. There's a lot of people uh, coming up um, or, or joining the world yeah, at this stage. And these people need to be fed. And of course, I understand that people will say, yeah, but we, we might think about uh, drinking less milk. But the thing is that in North America yeah, and Europe, that's where maybe people start thinking about drinking less milk. But in, if you look, for example, on the red part, these people just started to accept milk in their life. Yeah, they associate milk and milk products, especially if you think about ice cream, for example, they associate that with a, with a, um, a more um, developed uh, world. So it's not a fact that, or it's not a problem that indeed some people consider drinking less animal products or eating less animal products, but in the developing countries, and I shouldn't call them in fact like that, but there's a, a, a large amount of people coming that are st just starting to drink a little bit of milk. So somehow we need to produce a lot of uh, milk the coming years. What is the expected uh, need for milk? These are numbers from the United Nations. If you look at 2017, that's the 100%, then you can see that um, right now the estimate from the United Nations that within 50 years, we will need almost the double amount of milk. And the double amount of milk, I hope you appreciate that, yeah, that somehow, although we might live in countries where, for example, I live in, the, in, in Belgium and the Netherlands, there's a lot of debate about an, animal numbers. Well, this is very opposing to, in fact, what the United Nations state as the need for milk, yeah, just the next 50 years. We will indeed not do that with more cows. That's impossible. We cannot put more cows, yeah, on our planet. Yeah, what we need to do is somehow yeah, um, um, think about increasing milk production per cow if we ever want to be able to produce more milk with less animals. Look at the seven, 1917 dairy cow. Yeah, that was, world med, that was uh, the world champion in, uh, in medicine. Um, and I've put them yeah, over the last yeah, years until we are now. So I hope you will start appreciating, especially that the man who's holding the animal is needs to stretch his arms more and more i hope hope you also start looking at the conformation of the other and her wit yeah her chest width and what you will see is that her rear other especially she becomes bigger and bigger she has more wit yeah her rear other uh, quarters they are increasing uh, uh, bit by bit yeah so that we eventually end up right now with i think She's here. Yeah, this is the latest uh, World Medicine Champion. I think that was last year or the year um, or 2019, just before COVID. But you can see that the man has really almost difficulty holding her uh, hand. And she's what they will say, call uh, very dairy. Yeah. OK, this is beauty. Yeah, but there's also production uh, champions. I will show you that the production champion at this moment, which is called Cells Prale Aftershock. Yeah, at this stage, this animal has an annual milk record production yeah, of 35,000 plus kilograms of milk. I've seen the animal. I've seen the animal in Wisconsin. Yeah, she's in a smaller family herd. Yeah, but she has done incredible things. Look at this. At a certain moment, she's producing 11 kilograms of fat, protein, lactose a day. This is enormous. If I tell my mom this, nobody, under she will not understand. She will think I'm crazy. And I stopped expressing it as an, um, a kilogram of milk. I started expressing it in the number of people she can feed yeah, in one year. This animal, if you take the, the average uh, intake in dairy yeah, from an, um, a human in the world, then this animal alone will feed about 270 people per year, whereas the average cow yeah, is feeding about 20 uh, pe uh, people a year.
So I hope you, you see that instead of expressing it as a kilogram of milk, but expressing it as the number of people she can feed, this number becomes very different. If you would only have animals like her right now, so that means that we can tell to all the people in the world that are increasing milk production through genetics, let's say stop and we try to get to an average like she is, then we only need 4% of the animals to feed the world today. From a methane perspective, this is interesting. Yeah. If all cows were like her, yeah, by 2100, we only needed about 6% yeah, of the animals to feed the world. So the efficiency yeah, that we are trying achieving yeah, is, is interesting. Now there's a downside. And the downside is that at a certain moment, we know that, for example, at a certain level of production, methane efficiency doesn't go up very much. But on the other hand, there's other things that happen at the immediate moment as well. So if this one single animal is producing one truck of milk herself, then she needs about two trucks of, or she's producing about two truck, trucks of manure. She tr needs about three trucks of water um, to produce that milk. Uh, for some people in the world, that might sound obvious, that fresh water, but some countries really struggle getting that water to the animals. In the meantime, she's producing about the equivalent of three trucks of methane for that one truck of milk. And of course, what we know, she has four plant-based competitors in the meantime. She has an enormous amount of tweets that might pop up here and there about her welfare. But luckily, she also produces about 16 gigabytes of data. So you see my Twitch now. But I wanted you to appreciate that in somehow, you, I, wanted you to, I want you to appreciate that somehow that milk production need is there. Although some countries might be considering yeah, decreasing milk production, and I know that some of the European countries do, I think this is a threat. Yeah? It's a missed opportunity, but we need to handle, of course, the problems that the animal brings, often locally. Yeah? If you take at nitrogen from manure and phosphorus from manure, that's something locally, whereas methane is looked at from a world perspective. Okay, I just said she's producing some data. So let's have a look at what the kind of data she's producing. If we look at the, the, the definition of data, most often people will talk about the different Vs in big data. And I, I kind of, together with Christoph Hermans, I kind of changed it into a, an, um, an ID for dairy cows. So let's first look at the first V, that's the volume. Is there a lot of volume in dairy cows? Well, if you look at it, the volume is not really the, the problem of really volume. It's especially that the volume is scattered all over the place. So I've been working a lot with this kind of setups where we have precision livestock farming in the cloud. We have lab results somewhere at the lab. There's local herd management software. Yeah, there's data in the farmer's devices. There is data maybe in the feed um, mixer. We're now currently working with feed um, a lot. The idea is that the volume is not really big it's scattered all over the place. That's really the problem. If there is some kind of volume, yeah, interesting to look at, that's the volume from the, the genotypes. To give you an idea, if we start genotyping animals, then we're talking about, for example, if you look at RNA sequencing, yeah, then you have about 10 gigabytes of data per animal. If you roughly look at DNA sequencing, that's smaller because we're now not um, 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 analyzing the entire genome from the animal. We're mainly looking at um, uh, compressed, yeah, or parts of the DNA, then we're talking about one gigabyte for about 1,000 cows. I always tell people, if you want to read the entire genome of an animal, so every CTNG, uh, ACT, ACTG from the animal, yeah, then you need four gigabytes. But the thing is that we know that only a very small amount of the, the DNA is of interest for us. Okay, so the genotype. Now, in the meantime, we have also the velocity at which we are creating data. This is now an example, for example, from my own farm in the Netherlands. We have the Tollacker farm. It's an organic farm. And I'm quite interested in trying to install all the technologies that we can think about at this stage. So to give you a rough idea, we have uh, different sensors on the animals, which is the uh, Connectera, Alflex. The need-up is coming um, around the animals. We have an AI herd, which is a, a technology with which we're creating videos. We have the Moogle who is com 
combining all the data together with the feed information. We have milk meter information. So um, Clarified Plus has genotyped all our animals. So you see, we get the speed at which we are creating. So the velocity has increased enormously. And that means that you, I often have this kind of things going on. Hey, Mule, there is another update of the data. Or um, um, can, can I do an adjustment of the data because there was a mistake in the data? So the velocity is, is increasing as well. The problem is that we know that that data is only, in fact, lasting for five years, which is a, a strange thing. If you think about me, for example, doing a PhD with, an, uh, with, with animals, and now I'm not able to, let's say, reproduce that data, those animals, those were experimental animals. And in fact, we should be able to re reuse that data. Most, more often, it's, it's very interesting. Question is who will keep it, to, uh, to who will keep, uh, pay the bill to keep it alive? This is the main challenge. The variety of the data is enormous. Yeah, so we have a lot of um, <clears throat> differences in data sets, databases. We have differences in people, budgets, statistical programming languages, spoken languages is a very uh, big issue uh, to my idea, for example, in Europe where we have difficulties really understanding each other. I was in, um, in on the Precision Livestock Farming Conference two, two or three weeks ago, three weeks ago it was already. Yeah, and even the fact that we don't all speak the same language, what we saw in the last PLF conferences is that people from some of the countries that have difficulties with, for example, English, yeah, they, they were clearly unaware of a lot of research that has already happened and redoing uh, a lot of work that has been done in the past. Yeah, so this is a challenge that we need to think about, the variety in that. And then we have the velocity and the veracity. I make the joke here, you see an animal with two different ear numbers. Yeah, so there's a, a 4465, 4466. What is, the, what is the real identifier of this animal? Yeah, that's an issue. Yeah, that's an issue that we need to think about. It's one of the things that my students struggle with. Yesterday, I had another example of a student calling me saying, hey, look, I found out uh, that we really have um, uh, more animals in our experiment than we than we thought we had just because we were matching wrong uh, animal IDs. Yeah. And this is something that is, is continuously happening. If you look at the scientific reality, however, I want to put us ourselves a little bit with our boots in the manure, like I say. The scientific reality around all that data I want to show you a study that we did um, and published, I think, last year. This is a study done by my, my uh, PhD student, Peter Hutt. And he looked at, very simply, a study in which we were looking at the association between sensor data and locomotion score around the transition period. I'm now going to show you yeah, the graph with the locomotion scores in the beginning of the dry period, the end of the dry period, the early lactation stage and the late um, um, transition, uh, four weeks, uh, eight weeks in milk. So from left to right, we're looking at how the locomotion scores across these herds evolve. Yeah, and what you can clearly see, and I will show you data from the study later on, but very simply, the scientific reality, although that we have a lot of research being done at this moment about locomotion score, the reality check in 2020 is that we have about 30% of the animals which are scored as lame or severely lame in the beginning of the dry, dry period, moving towards 50% of the animals at the beginning of lactation. In the Netherlands, eight farms, well managed, but if you have somebody um, looking at the locomotion scores, this is the scientific reality. Something we should not be proud of as a dairy industry. Something that we urgently need to take care of. Yeah? If we want society accept, to accept us producing milk, we need to accept that society is questioning this kind of data. The industry reality, when we look at the data, is even worse, in my opinion. This is a picture of a farm that I work with. They have different systems, yeah? three different systems, three different screens, three different computers. Is the industry really willing and ready to, to collaborate, to bring that data together, to bring value, to start monitoring these animal welfare issues? Does the farmer ever get something back? Yeah, I rarely see that at the moment. We create 
tools as researchers. The industry tries to work with us, but we struggle. Yeah, there is a really constant look for the, the, the gold mining of the data. Yeah, but it's not easy to do it. The political reality is even worse. This was, and I have translated this into English. Um, so um, my excuse if you don't get this entirely, but you might have seen pictures of Dutch farmers protesting right now in the Netherlands and, and blocking highways. You might think about why do they do that? Ah, some, some of these things are about the fact that now, very um, recently, the government has put extreme harsh nitrogen emission um, constraints on barns, on farms, especially dairy farms. But what these farmers find out is that the reason why now suddenly the government has these metrics is that the data that they had provided not to be used like this was somehow, and this is a newspaper, it's not my statement, but um, it's a newspaper that states, look, the data from the farmers from their emissions was secretly passed to the government and then suddenly the government starts making decisions about um, these nitrogen uh, emissions and new rules. This is exactly the case what we need to avoid. This is the case where farmers, and I would be as well, I would be immediately not be willing to give one single bit or byte of data to anybody anymore if this is happening. Yeah, so we need to think, think about this. There's a scientific reality, there's an, an, um, an industry reality, and there's a polit political reality. Yeah. Let's move back to the, the, to the transition cow first. The transition cow, I want to start again by giving you some basic physiology, and I will then go towards the data. But I want you to understand in the industry that it all starts with the ruminal fermentation. So the ruminal fermentation is the most important part of the dairy cow, but it's also her threat. You will see here, for example, you see here gases, CO2, and methane being produced. There's a lot of debate right now. If you want to learn more, uh, please follow uh, Frank Mitleuner from the UC Davis. He's one of the, the, and he calls himself like that, also the methane gurus, yeah, who talks about the short cycle of methane versus the long cider, a cycle of, um, of, um, uh, of um, uh, um, uh, carbon dioxide produced via cows or the industry. Very nice, but there's one thing for sure is that if we have more cows on the world, then there's more methane. But that methane comes from the fact that she does something very in, in, interesting. She produces from forages, she produces VFAs, volatile fatty acids, propionate, which can be used yeah, by the cow to produce milk. That propionate goes to the liver and produces gluco glucose, gluconeogenesis. Glucose ends up in the bloodstream of the animal. And because of that rise in glucose, she starts getting a signal. Ah, okay, I can put some glucose towards fat and increase my fat reserves. However, the moment that she starts producing milk, that glucose is entirely driven towards her, um, towards the, 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 the milk. Yeah. And she starts losing fat again because she's in net negative energy balance. I will show you later on just to create a kind of an energy inside of the, the animal from that fat reserve but that fat reserve needs to go to the liver yeah and one of the things that we know is that cows can burn that fat through oxidation yeah nifa non-esterified fatty acid oxidation that yeah, can be used to create energy and then partly maybe even some glucose yeah it's very interesting for the cows to do but we know of course that not all of these animals can do that yeah, and then at a certain moment, something happens. They, they turn towards ketogenesis. Ketone bodies appear in the blood, which you can measure, measure in milk. You can measure it in, in the blood. You can measure it even in the bread of the animals. Yeah, so she switches from a less preferential energy um, um, generation towards ketogenesis. Uh, so from a, from a, a favorable um, um, energy production towards a less favorable energy production. And that's the ketogenesis. And lastly, yeah, she can even start depositing that fat again in her liver. And then we will talk about fatty liver uh, in the animals. Going back to the roots, the, the root cause of all of this is again, the lactogenesis. 
the fact that the animal is always yeah putting her her offspring yeah at number one she wants to produce lactose she wants to produce glucose for that lactose that's her problem in fact but that's an evolutionary problem yeah what is the goal of all mammals all mammals when the offspring is born they try to produce uh, energy for the offspring short high energy is fat long efficient energy is sugar yeah if you think about that cows produce colostrum a very important component of that colostrum is the fat the fat is produced so that the animal survives for a very short time with very little suckling and then she needs to start suckling yeah and be switches towards a sugar um, uh, component the lactose yeah animals cannot produce a, a lot of fat in their milk for a long time but is it for example um um, um seen in other species yeah how are mammals producing milk fat well in the beginning of lactations these animals don't eat a lot so the milk fat mainly comes from fat mobilization and i will give you an example yeah that's that you also i hope you also take this um in your in the back of your mind it's fat mobilization is not unique and i will show you the most extreme example this is the hooded seal the hooded seal is the animal in the world known with the shortest weaning days so it's it will it, it gives birth to a pup and then within four days it's weaned yeah but in those four days the the the, the, the female the, the mother yeah has milk fat of 60 percent um, milk fat as you can expect the animal when she gives birth looks like this and then four days, days later she's completely yeah lost all the weight and the and the uh, the offspring has tripled in um, or even sometimes quadrupled in weight just in four days because of the very high milk fat content how do mammals do that and this is the example that we know from cows cows for example they they drop in intake when they drop in intake yeah in the meantime they start mobilizing nifa non-esterified fatty acids so they start mobilizing body fat yeah and that's a normal process of course we don't want this to last for a long time that's the problem how is she producing glucose? Well, that comes mainly through the feed. And this is the weak component. If she's not, in, not eating enough because of her being sick or this or that, that, then that's a danger. But she can also spare some body glucose. And this is something that I want you to understand as well. There is a priority mechanism yeah, inside of, the, of, the, of, mammals, uh, of female mammals' bodies also in, in males, but we don't need, we don't give birth. So for males, it's more difficult. But what you should kn know is that at a certain moment, the glucose receptors or trans uh, transporters in the body are different at, in different organs. What it means is that in, the, um, in, the, in some organs, just like the brain, your blood oxygen transport, the uterus and the other, Glucose can always be taken up, always be taken up by the organ, yeah, independent of the glucose status, in fact, of the animal. And then I say immediately the insulin status. So if the, if the animal has a high glucose or a low glucose, these four, and it's not really limited to these four, but these are the most four important organs can always use glucose. If you have low glucose, low insulin, you, the animal still keeps taking glucose. Why? Because it wants to give more success to the offspring. Imagine that your mother would have eaten less when she gave birth because she was sick. Then you would have gotten less milk and less survival chances. Yeah. And what mammals do to um, spare some of that glucose is they will make every, all the other organs less responsive to insulin. The, we be, the, uh, let's say our mothers, yeah, mammals in early lactation, late um, uh, pregnancy, they become insulin resistant. But that's a normal thing. People sometimes ask me, ah, Mil, should we work on, on, uh, on um, uh, products or strategies to mitigate yeah, insulin resistance? Well, early, mil uh, early insulin resistance is necessary. Yeah? So in fact, you should not do that.
But every cow, independent of her genetic capacity, will always prioritize the offspring. That's very important to know. High yield, low yield, the offspring is number one. Now, the problem is this one. For the genetic selection that has happened in the meantime, because we have selected for a bigger cow, larger intake, larger liver, better growth hormone um, metabolism, larger other, yeah? So all of that made her produce more milk. But the genetic selection has not increased that quickly for her feed intake. It's about one kilogram of milk is only accompanied by about 0.5 kilograms of energy intake, they will say. on average. That's a rough estimation. So what we know is that because of that, the energy balance in these animals worsened. What are the results? I will show you some data from, 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 um, from um, um, large studies that we did. And in the meantime, we did four on one simple uh, dairy. Uh, simple dairy, I say a bit uh, irrespectful. It's, it's a big dairy, a good dairy. Yeah. Um, we looked at transition disease on, these, on, on this farm. And to give you an idea, one in three animals. So we recorded extremely well all the different metabolic disease in this farm. And one in three animals yeah, has some kind of disease. Yeah, I even called twinning a metabolic disease because it's, of course, a risk factor for all the others. Milk fever, retained placenta, metritis, ketosis, DA, mastitis up till the first 60, uh, the first 60 days in milk. What we know is that so one in three gets the, the, one of the disease. Now, we looked at the effect of production first, and then we, you can see in the graph that the green are the healthy animals, which did not encounter any disease. The orange were the ones having one metabolic disease, so one of the previously mentioned ones. And then the others are the uh, multiple metabolic disease, we call them. So they have, for example, milk fever and then a DA, or milk fever and a metritis. And what you can clearly see is that if you look at the effects of a single metabolic disease in our study, we found very limited effects, in fact. The only one that um, was quite detrimental to milk production was mitritis. That was about 500 kg kilogram of milk in an entire lactation. The others mainly worked via interactions. Yeah? And it's only when two diseases occurred at the same time, then you see that milk production got hit a little bit. You, you also see, I hope, that these red lines are a bit more, let's say, um, persistent. And then we, of course, had the question from people coming, did you also look at the reproduction uh, effects? And I want you to focus on the lower part. The left side is the heifers or the parity one animals, and the right side is the older animals. And then you see a survival curve on how quickly the animals became pregnant, given that they had a, a disease in the first, six, uh, first 60 uh, days in milk. And what you can see, for example, in the cows, yeah, is that if you had no metabolic disease, then only about 30% 30 of the animals was still open, not pregnant, at 200 days in milk. Whereas if you have a metabolic disease, one or more in the cows, you immediately almost double that um, percentage of open cows. So your conception rate really gets, gets hit yeah, by these um, uh, um, transition diseases. In the heifers, it was more subtle. You can see that, yeah, but, it's, but definitely there, there, there is an effect. Last one that we looked at is, of course, yeah, what is, what's the effect on culling? And that this is also interesting to see, yeah, that this is a survival curve of the same um, data set where we look at what's the percentage of animals that left the herd at a specific moment. We evaluated culling at 120 days, and then you can see that animals that are healthy, the green line, about 90% of the animals are still on the farm yeah, after 120 days. Whereas if you have the disease, then you see again, metabolic disease one, and then the multiple, you immediately get quite big hits. I want to show you some more data from studies that we recently did on transition cows. This is a sense of sensor product that we did together with NEEDUP and um, some companies in the Netherlands. We had eight herds very intensely followed with the sensors, a lot of PhD students and, um, and, and uh, master students involved in intensive transition monitoring. I already talked about this study when the, about the locomotion score, where I showed you that the locomotion score worsened over time. What we did is we looked at, okay, but what does, what does it mean if you have a specific locomotion score in time? 
So we looked, for example, on the number of steps pre-partum and post-partum, and then you can see that the healthy animals pre-partum, they take about 3,000 steps, and then once you get a locomotion score, yeah, that is three or four plus, then this is decreasing. Okay, locomotion score, that's not so, um, not, so, not so normal. These animals also lay more, lay down more. Laying time, time is increased, yeah? That's not so, um, um, let's say, um, interesting to know. But what is very interesting to see is the amount of time that these animals eat less. If you look at, for example, the healthy animals, they eat 360 minutes in the dry period, yeah? Then if they become lame, yeah, they drop about 40 minutes yeah, between um, green versus red. Yeah, so the severely lame, 40 minutes. And this effect keeps being there postpartum as well. You see that on the, on the right part. We have shown that for all different um, 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 sensors. Important to know is that we also looked at this <coughs> from a different perspective. Because my position was focusing very much immediately on the locomotion score. We also wanted to look at Okay, but what is the possibility to just look at data from cows and heifers in the transition period and kind of create a benchmark? The amount of minutes, which is normal for animals to eat, to ruminate, to lie down. So we created this graph, and I hope I'm zooming in a little bit. Yeah, this is a graph showing you the months in milk after parturition. So month zero is when they were uh, giving birth. Yeah, and then this is the month in the close-up. This is the first month after calving. And then I hope you can see that these, for example, parity one animals, they, during the transition, yeah, they have to increase almost more up to an hour, yeah, in their um, feed intake measured as eating time in minutes per day. So these animals, they take up to five to six months in milk before they are at a level where they can start, yeah, let's say competing probably with the other animals. So they are doing a lot of things different versus the parity two. Then you see once they are here, then they enter the parity two, then they drop in eating minutes because they get a wider beak. They are eating more aggressively. So their mouth is bigger. Yeah. And then the the uh, old cows, you see that they go back to about uh, 300 minutes. So heifers are really, let's say, changing their behavior over time um, in that transition um, period. And we're now looking at different setups. Question, of course, is what do they do? Well, I will show you immediately that what we know is that these animals, they are standing more. Yeah, they are st standing quite some minutes more and laying down less. Yeah, and that's worrying. Because these heifers are young, vulnerable, yeah, and it seems somehow that their, their behavioral pattern yeah, can learn still a lot of things about that transition. We had that data, and I also wanted to know a kind of a diurnal pattern. I wanted to know what are cows doing when during the day. I also had quite some discussion with robotic fa uh, farms and the robot the people selling robots about this kind of things. And I never had the data, but now we have them. This is not months in milk, but this is the time in the day from our animals. And then I hope you can see eating time. That eating time goes down around four o'clock in the morning, then goes up for the two lines. And I'll explain in a minute yeah, um, what's going on. And then it drops again at night. So cows don't eat really during the night from our data. The cows in our system. The difference between the two lines is the CMS versus AMS, conventional milking system and grazing versus robotic system and non-grazing. It's important to state that grazing component because our uh, herds were nested. Uh, so the grazing herds were immediately the, the conventional milk. What you can see is that this is the equal yeah, on both farms, except for this here during the day. And this part is probably because of the grazing that we see in those herds during the day. And then we see the same, but the opposite for the rumination. So if we look at rumination time, cows really ruminate at night. Yeah, they go up a little bit in rumination, but the most part of the rumination is done at night. Yeah, and this is different than what some people might have, have, have uh, thought about. Yeah, 
Um, we're now looking also into doing this on a large number of, of, of um, farms because we want to make sure also in the diversity of farms that we cover the whole pattern. That's roughly, let's say, when we look at associations between sensors and transition data that we have. I want to show you one very small component yeah, at the end of my uh, presentation that we're working on, and that's the prediction. We need to integrate a lot of information on farms to be able to predict the future. Yeah, I would like to state that I'm a big fan of neural networks and deep learning, but we need the human neural network, which is the human brain, to keep working. And that is called domain knowledge. Yeah, We need to keep helping this farmer. Yeah, We had a, a project running in, in Utrecht and uh, Ghent University in which we are looking at this kind of situation. The farmer just wants to know which cow deserves my attention. So what we did is we helped uh, um, um, or we, we used data from farms and we tried to combine all different sources. So we had different herd management systems combined with different milking systems. And we applied deep learning techniques on this using uh, techniques that also Google is using. And what I want to especially show you is the, the the latest paper that we had is now um, is being published um, but the one that is already out there is this one in computer and electronics in agriculture is the one from Arno Lizione, one of my PhD students and what he did is he we tried to use all data from the farm and tried to say look imagine that we have all this information on the farm can we predict who will be sick or is getting sick so can we use all the information from the previous lactation and the farm to think about what is happening in early lactation? We're now creating this also in a, in a, in a, in a Belgian project. We're creating um, uh, uh, reports to the farms yeah, where we illustrate how, let's say, the, the initiation of milk um, and, and, and the transition period is going on this farm and we're ranking him uh, amongst other farms and showing, okay, watch out right now, your cows are in fact not producing the amount of milk that we would expect them to produce. We're also looking at some other transition problems using uh, the deep learning techniques. This is one that we're doing, uh, that we just recently uh, finished. And that's the one where we are <clears throat> predicting the moment of calving yeah, using um, uh, deep learning, uh, because we know that these sensors, they should be able to predict the moment of calving, because then we can alert farmers, watch out, this animal is calving very soon. Yeah, so we're moving from association studies bit by bit to prediction studies. And with that, I hope that I have created a kind of an overview, starting from really the basic, why do we drink milk? What is the physiology which is important to understand in the transition cow? What are some associations that we see between data, sensor information from that transition cow? And then now that we need to move towards um, a more data-driven prediction modeling, and we're doing that uh, bit by bit uh, for the transition cow. So with all of that, I hope that you kind of had a feeling of what's going on. And for those people who are interested, you can find quite some information on, the, on these links. You can find me on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I'm a bit more active than Twitter nowadays. And I'm always looking for people who are interested uh, to work in the veterinary, dairy, and data science world. Um, and with that, I think I will um, end my presentation for um, today. And I'm uh, willing to take any questions. Yes, thank you, Emil. Thank you. Um, which brings us to the Q and A sessions uh, session. Um, we have uh, uh, one question that just came in. Uh, I will read it to you if that's okay, Emil. Um, you discussed a little bit on biomarkers. You touched up some biomarkers, which, and and you also spoke about uh, moving from association to more predictions. Huh? Um, so, which biomarkers? are useful or could become useful in the prediction of, of um, transition phase related health yeah. issues in dairy? 
one of the things that we've we've, we've been doing on over the last um, months or years is also looking indeed at uh, blood biomarkers milk biomarkers because everybody's right now um, trying to move towards that um, prediction so we have a lot of association studies moving towards prediction the interesting ones yeah um, we first of all we 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 much um, we much need reference populations first and from those reference populations, what I mean is that we need populations of dairy cows in which we have sampled quite some biomarkers, blood biomarkers, to really identify which cows are healthy and which are not. Blood biomarkers, if you think about that, for example, is um, um, NIFA, BHB, IGF. Um, those are the ones at this moment, calcium, which are very interesting, I think. You could make very nice blood profiles from these animals for the, from the reference population. But then what we need to do is we need to move away from that uh, blood sampling and move towards milk, probably. Yeah. I think in milk, the, the most active, let's say, uh, um, groups are focusing on mid-infrared. Yeah, so that spectral data. And from that mid uh, from that mid infrared, people are now starting to look at near infrared, maybe picture analysis from milk, um, looking at scattering of data, and you see that something is happening there. But it's not easy um, because the fact is that the mid infrared is extremely expensive, and near infrared is still uh, has still a long way to go. But we will end up in a situation, I think, that in some years. Quite some of the robotics uh, are already doing some. Affy Milk is having their Affy Lab, are trying to, yeah, predict disease, metabolic statuses, balanced animals like you uh, put in your question, uh, predict them from the milk. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I think right now NIFA, BHB, calcium, IGF would would be my preferred partner in the blood. But then we need to move towards milk. But that's still a long way to go. So you're really looking still for, firstly, create more association with with a kind of yeah. what they would call in data science a ground a, a, a ground truth, truth. Yeah. ground truth on, yeah. on on health, right? The real problem at this moment is not the data; it's the ground truth. Yeah, that's the that's the problem that we have. We um, we're looking at setting up studies where we really create reference populations that's what the geneticists as well the, the geneticists they know that the heritability in dairy cows of specific disease is much how, higher than anticipated because probably the reference populations that we were using up to now are not accurate enough yeah yeah okay good that there is a um there's not a question um how can we manage fresh cow groups with low production rate compared to others I guess, with higher production rate over the first 10 days. Is there a difference in terms of the management of low production versus high productive uh, cows? Hmm. I think when it comes to management, I would, um, I, I would say no. There's probably not a big difference. Um, why? Because they're, again, they're the same type of physiology in the back. Um, these animals are also, even though they're, the production might not be as big in some countries still these animals face a challenge and that is first i want to make sure that my offspring is 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 fed correctly or is 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 getting the uh, required amount of glucose so i would not um, manage them very differently i would definitely not do that of course um, I was yesterday, I was on a farm with some a bit of a lower production and I saw that in their, in their close up, they were doing things that in a, in a very high yielding herd, I would not do. But I think from a basic, let's say up to 8,000 kilograms of milk, I don't know if I would do, I would treat them very different. Okay. And then there's another one talking about transition and, and, and now also management. Um, um dry period management versus uh, transition period so the question is is there a connection between the dry period management 
and the transition period for better animal health and productivity. Yeah. That's of course the 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 the, the, the holy grail. Eh? So if we now can monitor these animals somehow, what is the best management? Um, yes, there is definitely um, a link. So if you look at the Wisconsin studies using transition cow indexes, we know that there is a link, and the link is mainly driven by um, getting them better lying times in the dry period, making sure they're no, not overstocking. Yeah, making sure that they're in some kind of transition protocol, which could mean uh, specific feed additives around the moment of calving. Yeah, so we know that these are the things. Yeah, that that drive uh, good transition health. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a link between those two. To give you an idea, we're working right now. So I showed the prediction studies. In those prediction studies, right now, we're having a big association study that we're um, doing, focusing on transition cow management and the success of transition. Uh, so there's diff we're going to have some uh, new data coming up uh, uh, recently. Yeah. So good, great. Yeah, I think uh, great answer. Uh, every another one. Every week we dry cows and include them in the existing group. The uh, the, the yeah. group of other dry cows that are a little bit further in in their in their gestation. And um, how does hierarchy and possibly stress? related with hierarchy affect the metabolism of these cows or maybe also uh, that's from my personal addition also their their feed intake firstly right yeah, yeah. Um, incredibly interesting question um, nobody ever looked at it because we, we're having difficulties in measuring it so one of the things i said uh, or one, one of the things i missed saying is that in, in the dry cow management we know that a regrouping of cows is not good for example, I have helped designing some uh, bigger farms in the Netherlands, focusing on stable transition cow management, where you really try to avoid grouping. The fact that you're indeed um, uh, drying off cows every week and then putting them in the far off, let's say, if you have two groups already. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the fact that you're giving them some, some stress and, a, and, a, and a, a, a dip in dry matter to move them to the far off is not a problem because it's maybe it's even a good thing because you're pushing milk a little bit down. Yeah. So the moment that you're drying them off, I remember the, the farm that we, I showed you the studies on um, the, the, the lactation curves and the effect of transition cow. I remember the farmer was always saying to me, I don't mind drying off cows with um, a high amount of milk. I just give them the right amount of stress, which is a good hoof trim, a regrouping of barn and a regrouping of the, of the, the, the group they are in often gives them enough um, a hit in, um, in, in dry matter intake. And because of that, they stop uh, um, uh, milking uh, or they go dry more easily. Now, I want to add to that, that this does not hold, of course, for the grouping or regrouping around transition. Yeah, we know that, for example, we did a, a survey some years ago in, in the Netherlands and we looked at what was the strategy in dry cow management and what we still see is that half of the people have one group of dry cows and the other one has two groups what about the hierarchy at the moment that these cows go from far off to close up it's just now that we have the sensor data yeah that we will start seeing what the impact of of um, hierarchy is i want to add one which is very interesting that one that we are working with right now we now have um, camera observations. Um, the, the whole world of vision is changing in such a way that we can um, uh, um, now learn from video. And with video, you can really also see interactions. Yeah, which cow interacts with whom? So which is the hierarchy about around cows? And yeah. this is something that is just popping up now, but it's 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 moving rapidly. Um, and, and I think we will see some interesting data coming on those hierarchy. Uh, so maybe, that, maybe you, you started with saying that has not been studied. Now maybe with vision, uh, yeah. that, that can actually be studied. Uh, yeah. If yeah. I summarize your answer, you're saying, okay, maybe it's not that problematic to, to have stress at the point of dry, start of dry period. But yeah. I think that if I listen to you during that period, halfway, yeah. you don't want to disturb no. that animal. You don't want to, no, not at all. Everything so, that, that, that disturbs that dry matter intake, we know that there's a lot going on and there's now some new people or some people with very nice new insights on that, that, that transitioning. 
Um, so I would really uh, uh, advise all of you to do, if you want to work on something three weeks before, three weeks after, um, and focus on not having them drop in the dry matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is uh, one question, uh, a short one, um, specifically on urine strips. To what extent are rapid urine strips reliable in predicting unbalanced counts or another bio source of biomarkers? Biomarker. Yeah. yeah, I would, I would still um, advise them. Yeah, there's now the possibility at this stage. Um, I, I recently got a, um, um, a company coming to me with a new kind of uh, uh, BHB um, blood test strips. Yeah, prices of these are still higher than the urine strips, and the fact is, urine strips are made for humans. Yeah, so they can also be used for cows, and that's why they are so cheap. The BHB strips are not that popular in in um, in the in human industry, so they are specifically made for cows, and that's why they are still, I think, around yeah, what is it, fifty cents to about one euro per cow. Um, now, um, I would definitely advise the urine strips. Still, there are some downsides of it, but as long as you're not doing it as a one-time observation, but you're doing it over time and you're monitoring monitoring it through time they are reliable yeah yeah well great uh Mil. thank you um uh, thank you for your great presentation and uh you know for um uh being able to to answer all of these questions that came in um i would um, um like to uh, stick to the time respect the time of all of us some of them is in the evening in the afternoon and uh, um, um, so i would like to uh, thank you firstly also the audience for all the questions in the Q and A box, for your attendance, um, and um, um, so you know, if there's other questions that you would like to uh, to uh, send, please uh, use the webinar at ewnutrition.com email address, and we will direct these questions and uh, and answer them to the best of our capability. Um, thank you all very much. Special thanks to Meal, um, and um, yeah, see each other soon again thanks again um for the opportunity to talk um, and if, you, if somebody has any questions they can always send us indeed yes thank you very much thank you bye 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 bye